Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, people are still coming in, uh, but it's starting to go up a little bit more slowly. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to uh, Baylor University History Department's annual Women's History Month uh, lecture. Uh, I am Bob Elder. I'm an assistant professor of history here at Baylor. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, and uh, today I'm just going to be moderating uh, the, the uh, talk and especially the Q&A afterwards. So uh, welcome. Uh, before we get started and before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to mention that we are using a, the webinar function of Zoom. And uh, the relevant difference for many of you is that we're going to be taking questions after the talk. If you'd like to submit a question uh, down at the bottom of the, of the Zoom uh, window, you can see a Q&A button. And if you submit your questions, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna submit those questions so that Professor Greenberg and I at least can see them. And you can do that at any time during the talk. In fact, I would encourage you as, as during the talk to go ahead and submit questions that you'd like. Um, and when Professor Greenberg is uh, finished, I'll select uh, some of those questions and we'll start having a conversation uh, about those. So uh, let me, let me uh, go ahead and introduce our speaker. We're incredibly lucky and fortunate uh, this year to have Professor Amy S. Greenberg uh, as our speaker. Professor Greenberg is the George Winfrey Professor of American History at Pennsylvania State University. Uh, she is a historian of antebellum America and she's authored five books. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, three of those right quick. Her first book was Cause for Alarm, the Volunteer Fire Department in the 19th Century City, which came out in 1998. Uh, another recent book, one I use in my classes, is A, a History of the Mexican-American War, uh, titled A Wicked War, Polk, Clay, Lincoln, and the 1846 U.S. Invasion of Mexico, which came out in 2012. Most recently, and the book from which her talk today is taken, is uh, Lady First, The World of First Lady Sarah Polk, which came out in 2019. Uh, among her many awards, uh, Professor Greenberg has been awarded a, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2009. In 2018, she was awarded a Public Scholar Fellowship from the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities, I assume for, for Lady First. Uh, and uh, she is currently the president of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. Uh, her talk today is titled Female Political Power Before the Vote, Why Some Washington DC Ladies Saw No Need for Women's Rights in the 1840s. Um, and I should mention that Professor Greenberg was scheduled to be our speaker last year before the pandemic. And so we're, we're really grateful that she was willing to come back and do this virtually this year. So Professor Greenberg, welcome virtually to Baylor and the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Bob. And thanks to the Baylor History Department for having me out. Uh, it is a pleasure. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, of course, but we will soldier on. Um, as Bob mentioned, I'm here to talk to you guys about women and political power uh, before the vote. Now, as you all know, I'm sure, We've just finished celebrating the centennial anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which provided women with the right to vote. And there's nothing more important in the history of women in politics, um, of course, than women voting. Uh, here you can see um, the portrait monument to suffrage pioneers, which stands in the rotunda of the US Capitol building, uh, memorializing in marble, three of the women who in the late 1840s and early 1850s began the women's suffrage movement. Um, from left, you see Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, and Susan B. Anthony. Now Mott organized the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention for the Rights of Women. And it was at Seneca Falls where Elizabeth Cady Stanton first demanded women's right to vote. And Stanton and Anthony later went on and wrote a history of the women's suffrage movement that enshrined Seneca Falls as the key moment when um, women's political struggle to, be, um, to gain the right to vote began. Uh, 
Now, um, this is great. More power to these women and the stuff that they did. But you know, one thing about focusing on voting is that it obscures a lot about women's political power before they could vote. Um, and what I want to do today is I'm going to talk to you all about how women practiced politics before they were able to vote. And in particular, why the women that you see here were not the most powerful, politically powerful women in 1848. The most politically powerful woman in 1848 was Sarah Childress Polk, who you see right here. Um, Mrs. James K. Polk is the name that she preferred for herself. She uh, was a proud member of the Democratic Party and an opponent of women's suffrage in 1848. Uh, and yet she um, exercised power um, on a par with many uh, men in Washington, DC and was widely respected um, and consulted by men about political um, subjects. So um, we're just gonna turn our focus away from women's suffrage and get a kind of bigger look at women and politics in the 1840s. Now, um, there's a reason why we don't think about women being political outside of voting. And that's because the main ideology um, of the 19th century for women was this um, ideology of separate spheres, which suggested that there were two realms, um, a public realm and a private realm, and that women belonged just by nature to the private realm. And you see a wonderful illustration here of this um, idea of domesticity in women's spheres of, and separate spheres in the woman's sphere, where the mother sways the dominion of the heart and the father that of the intellect. Now, within this ideology, women were unsuited to politics and not shouldn't have been interested in politics because that was the dominion of men. Um, but in fact, uh, if you look closely, you can see a ton of evidence that women were intimately involved with politics uh, in the 19th century. Here I have an image of Andrew Jackson's inauguration, the inauguration that famously um, became a riot uh, as women and men stormed the White House in order to get close to their idol, Andrew Jackson. And then here we have another image um, from 1840, um, 1841 of uh, William Henry Harrison's inauguration inauguration that was um, widely supported by women um, because they identified with the Whig Party. So what um, is going on here? What, why are there women? What are women doing? Um, how are women partisans in the 19th century? Okay, so here's a really important thing to realize. Just because women couldn't vote didn't mean that women weren't political. Women identified as members of political parties in the 1840s um, and 1850s and the late 19th century, um, and they did so openly. What did it mean to be a political partisan if you couldn't vote? Well, there was actually a lot that you can do and women did the things that they could. They attended political events like the inaugurations that I showed you. Um, they also attended um, dinners for political candidates, went and listened to speeches of political candidates. Um, and as I'm going to talk about later, uh, they were very active in Washington, D.C., going to listen to Congress and speaking to congressmen. But just looking nationally, um, everywhere in the United States you could go, you could find women who were involved in politics. They read political newspapers and they influenced men um, to vote in favor of the candidates that they supported. You can see um, on the left side of the screen here, a handkerchief, which was embroidered by a woman in support of William Henry Harrison and reform. Now Harrison, of course, was the first candidate of the Whig Party. And the Whig Party um, kind of made a name for itself by embracing women. It actively courted female supporters and celebrated them in rallies and parades. They gave women uh, special spots and parades um, to march. Uh, and women were so active um, in the Whig Party and in support of the Whig Party that historians have basically sort of taken it at face value that what women and men said at the time, which was that all the women were Whigs. Um, and that line actually um, referred to a kind of um, 
comment um, made about Henry Clay, which was that um, all the women supported Henry Clay and that basically women in general were all Whigs. And there, there's a lot of great anecdotes of male democratic politicians whose wives um, belong to or ran um, Clay clubs or ran clubs um, in favor of the Whigs. Uh, and so yeah, women were supported the Whigs and the Whigs supported women. Um, the Whig party realized that women could be really great allies uh, in getting um, their candidates elected. Now, what I discovered in the course of the research that I did for the book um, that Bob was mentioning, Lady First, is that there were actually a lot of female Democrats too. Um, now, the, these women are not as obvious. The Democratic Party was very patriarchal and it would not allow women in its parades. It certainly didn't discuss um, the power of women um, in speeches. Uh, so in principle, it really didn't support political women. Uh, but what I found in my research is that there were a lot of women who, Demo who identified as Democrats anyhow. And I just want to tell you one little anecdote um, drawn from the papers of um, James K. Polk. And it was a friend of Polk's wrote to him and said that when Andrew Jackson first ran for president in 1824, this guy, Polk's friend, um, he didn't support Jackson because he wasn't sure Jackson was the right kind of person to become president. By that he meant he was a Westerner, he was uneducated, um, he didn't really have a lot of political gravitas. But this guy said, he said to Polk, he said, as you know, my wife has always been the firmest Democrat. And she took one of Jackson's speeches and had it printed on silk and hung it up right in their house uh, to prove and show how much she supported Jackson before he did. And then the guy went on and said, he said to Polk, he said, well, you know, she ended up, of course, being right that Jackson ended up being a great president. Now, um, there are women partisans everywhere, um, but there's some women whose practice of politics um, moved beyond just influence and actually entered the realm of affecting politics directly. And uh, above all, I would point to the subject of my biography, uh, Sarah Childers Polk, who you see here in the earliest known image, probably painted when she was about 20. Um, Sarah Polk becomes the leading figure in a circle of Washington, D.C. women who are actively involved in politics. They're political actors. And these women, most of them do not support the idea of women's suffrage. Sarah was first lady when the um, uh, Seneca Falls uh, meeting took place and she wasn't in support of it. She did not think women should vote. And she believed that in general, men were the heads of households and that men um, could be counted on to make decisions that would uh, account for the beliefs of their families. At the same time, however, she understood herself as an exception to that. So if I were to answer the question directly, why did some Washington DC ladies who were politically powerful not feel like suffrage was a good idea? The easy answer is that they didn't feel like suffrage was a good idea because they were powerful already without suffrage. Okay, so how do we get a woman like Sarah Polk, who becomes first lady and becomes so politically powerful, while at the same time um, claiming that men are more powerful than women. I'll tell you a little bit about her. So Sarah Childress was born in 1803 in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And were it not for her marriage to James K. Polk, when she was 20 and he was 28, no one would know her name. She would fade into obscurity like all the 19th century women whose identities were subsumed into their husbands upon marriage and who devoted their lives to their families. Now, according to rumor, it was Andrew Jackson who encouraged James, K, James Polk, who was then a young state legislator, to court the teenage Sarah Childress. Polk had gone to school with her brother and had met and admired the young woman. But he probably didn't need Jackson's advice because Sarah was a great catch for any up and coming young man. She was charming, she was very rich, and she was very well connected. She grew up calling Andrew Jackson Uncle Andrew, and her um, family was very politically well connected. 
Now, Sarah and James hailed from similar backgrounds. Both the Childresses and the Polks were slave-owning Presbyterians at the pinnacle of Tennessee society. Sarah's father was a wealthy land speculator who recognized and encouraged the unusual intelligence of both of his daughters. He sent them to North Carolina to attend the exclusive Salem Women's Academy, which was the very best school open to women in the region. And some people would argue the best school open to women, period. Uh, like her future husband, she excelled academically. And the couple married at her parents' home near Murfreesboro on New Year's Day in 1824. By 1826, uh, at the age of 23, she was living in Washington, D.C. and helping her husband James in the business of serving as a congressman. Now, Sarah was in many ways a typical and conservative Southern white woman. She was a strict Presbyterian of the old school uh, who was convinced that hierarchy was predestined. So in her view, the fact that there was slavery was biblically um, written and just a fact of life. And that men um, were, had power over women was equally um, predestined. Now, this actually set Sarah apart from probably most of her neighbors at the time. Evangelical sects um, were beginning to question this received wisdom and asserting the equality of all men and women in God's eyes. And, and, but Sarah, she, she was pretty, pretty old school. Now, in some other ways, Sarah was decidedly atypical. And the most important way that she was atypical was that she was childless. And this was in an era when childbearing and rearing defined a woman's life. Even before she got married, she delighted in party politics, not just the legislation and principles that impacted the life of all Americans and inspired fierce partisanship, but also the practice of party politics, the campaigning, the gossip, the coalition building and the elections that consumed the vast majority of a candidate's time. And she came by this naturally, her father and her brother had both been political and sharing that passion with her had been one way in which they had treated Sarah as special. Now the first two decades of Sarah's life coincided with a vast expansion of the vote among white men and simultaneous creation of party politics as average Americans came to realize that politics could be a means to power. I believe that James and Sarah got married in large part because they both loved politics and they knew from the start that they were going to be a political team. James embraced his wife's political skills. Um, and as you'll see, if you read the book, he really pushed her to become more and more political. He pulled her into his political world making sort of remarkable demands on her time and abilities that only increased over the course of his political career. And of course, he could only do that because they didn't have children. And in case you're wondering why they didn't have children, James had a surgery when he was a teenager um, to remove bladder stones that left him unable to father a child. Now, um, James used to joke that had he remained the clerk of the legislature, Sarah would never have consented to marry him but he was probably not far from the mark. Before their wedding, Sarah extracted a promise that he would run for Congress, and he did soon after their marriage. Now, congressmen rarely brought their wives with them to Washington. Conditions were too rustic. Um, virtually all men lived in boarding houses. And James, following convention, spent his first year in Washington alone, but both he and Sarah were miserable with this arrangement. And James quickly realized that the discomfort of boarding house life would not bother his energetic and um, ambitious wife as it would women with children. So she returned with him the following year and thrived in the intensely political atmosphere um, of Washington, DC. Now, one of Sarah's key political innovations was to turn her Washington boarding house into a political salon, taking extra rooms for the purpose of political entertainment. Now, to understand Sarah Childress Polk's rise to power, you need to understand the practice of politics in Washington, D.C. during the Jacksonian era. Washington had a population of 18,000 people in 1830, but the political class was much smaller. It was, in effect, a small town that ran on gossip. Men exchanged rumors about personal and political indiscretions, about secret alliances, and about political fortunes. Women exchanged rumors about sexual indiscretion, courtship, and political fortunes. 
Gossip was a fixture of national politics during the first Congress when the absence of established parties created the importance of personal reputation to a man's political success. By the 1820s, when the Polks arrived, Washington's men and women gossiped constantly, but separately. Women gossiped with women, men with men. Talk of this sort did more than titillate and entertain. It could have a transformative impact on a man's political career or even the fate of an entire presidential candidate. Women were everywhere in Washington, DC. There was special space set aside for them in the congressional galleries where women could sit. Um, there was one day per session where only women were allowed in the galleries. And wealthy women often approached politicians directly to lobby them for legislation that they supported. And these wealthy women felt they had the right to do that, despite the idea that women were not supposed to be political, because their money and their access to power allowed them to. So in other words, once again, you see there is a big distinction between the rhetoric of what women are supposed to be doing and what women are actually doing at the same time. Now, Sarah Childress Polk was the first political wife to successfully bridge the gap between male and female gossip. Equally comfortable in both worlds, she discovered that men were willing to tell her things they might not tell another man, and wives were the best source of news about husbands and the men they entertained. Now, historian Rachel Sheldon has argued that due to a variety of local circumstances, important political alliances and decisions were inevitably made outside the halls of Congress in the antebellum era in social clubs, in boarding houses, and in private homes. Now, Sarah's facility in this realm was of crucial importance to buttressing her husband's position. She set the conditions for Polk to form alliances and influence other politicians, but she also, as we'll see, influenced other politicians directly. Here's a picture of a boarding house, um, very much like the one that Sarah and James Polk lived in and where Sarah took extra rooms for the purposes of entertaining men. Here's a picture of James as Speaker of the House, um, a position that he won uh, thanks to his alliance with Andrew Jackson. Now, Sarah's access to news and skill deploying it um, drew men to her. Although many women were fond of Sarah, her closest relationships were all with men. First her father, then her brother, and then many of James' political colleagues in Tennessee. Now, none of these men could be considered enlightened on the matter of gender relations, but each of these men treated her like an equal and wrote to her without condescension about political matters. Above all others was her husband, James, um, and they became a remarkably harmonious and successful political team. Sarah felt comfortable advising her husband on both politics and tactics. She warned him against running for a short session of the Senate when he was governor of Tennessee and told him which editors were not to be trusted. He almost never ignored her advice, nor was James the only person who turned to Sarah for advice. Congressmen, senators, and a justice of the Supreme Court sought out her opinion on political matters and depended on her for the inside information that enabled the successful navigation of the fraught Washington political scene in the era of the second party system. One wrote to her to ask if votes in a certain county were admiss, noting that, quote, no one is likely to know as well as you. This is somebody accepting that Sarah is on top of the actual count of votes in a particular county. Now, um, James recognized Sarah's skill at lobbying men. Um, James was very reserved and Sarah was very outgoing. So um, that combination um, definitely uh, allowed James to see that Sarah was good at lobbying people. But um, lobbying was all that James, far from all that James asked from her. Early in their marriage, uh, when she would tell James, who was a notorious uh, workaholic, to put out the lamp and come to bed, he instead put her to work. Taking up a newspaper, he would quietly reply, Sarah, here's something I wish you to read. And so she said, he sent me to work too. Soon she was analyzing political debates for him. She became a regular companion on James's political excursions. Uh, and she said about this, um, he always wished me to go. He would say, why should you stay at home to take care of the house? Why, well, if the house burns down, we can live without it. Now, um, whether James asked Sarah to travel with him on all of his political events um, because he didn't want her to be lonely in their childless house, 
or whether he actually needed her advice, um, it seems sort of beside the point because Sarah became his closest political advisor. Now this suited her fine. As one friend of hers remarked, knowing much of political affairs, she found pleasure in the society of gentlemen. Um, rather than socializing with other wives, Sarah could be found with the men. The friend said, quote, she was always in the parlor with Mr. Polk. And I've got an image here of a presidential reception at the White House to give you a sense of the kind of events that Sarah is going to successfully throw um, once she's first lady in order to advance um, Polk's fortune and to lobby uh, other politicians. Now, um, Sarah was uh, extremely successful in the role of political spouse um, and she carried this ability from Washington DC um, as when she was the wife of when James was the speaker, back to Tennessee when he ran for governor and then back to Washington again. The best set of letters that we have between James and Sarah because they were together so much there really aren't that many letters um, between them is when he was running for governor. Um, he ran once and um, won the governorship and then he used defeated for election twice. Um, and the letters during these campaigns reveal how utterly dependent on Sarah James had become for political information. At one point he wrote her, um, you must send me news and why have you not sent me news? Sarah's inability to live up to his expectations pained her. Um, she once replied with exasperation, I'm unable to learn anything with a house full of guests. I trust you won't hold it against me that the housework is neglected. Um, and this response I think reveals how playful they were with conventional gender roles. He didn't care that she ignored domestic matters as long as she continued to provide him with the political information that he needed. Uh, and in effect, James made Sarah his campaign manager um, during those campaigns um, in Tennessee. And this control of campaign news was something that um, was well known and that she would carry with her when they went back to the White House. Now, James's fortunes improved dramatically uh, in 1844 when President John Tyler attempted to annex Texas. The two front runners for the nomination, of course, were Henry Clay and Martin Van Buren, both of whom opposed Texas annexation. But James K. Polk, um, our first dark horse candidate, he became the Democratic nominee because he supported Texas annexation and manifest destiny. Now, his family and Sarah's family had both grown wealthy speculating in lands on the Western frontier, um, on lands that had been taken from um, indigenous peoples. James issued a letter in favor of Texas annexation and found um, a supportive national argument, a, a supportive national um, audience for his argument that um, Texas belonged in the United States. Now, Sarah served as James' campaign coordinator um, when he ran for president. Here's a picture of Sarah at this point in her life. Uh, when Polk was first nominated, one advisor encouraged him to put Sarah to work. James might lack the time or tact to conciliate or please, uh, this guy wrote, but Sarah could. The wife of a man aspiring to the White House is no minor circumstance. Mrs. Polk should be visited by Whigs and Democrats of her own sex, as the ladies of the other side uniformly speak well and highly of her. And even Polk's allies recognize that um, James's sort of prickly personality required management. Fortunately, Sarah, unlike her husband, was described as always a good listener. Polk was elected in 1844 in part because of his stance on Texas, but Sarah's reputation for piousness also played a role in the campaign. Some weak skeptical or outright hostile to her husband's election hoped that she might have a positive influence on his administration. Sarah Preston Hale of Massachusetts, a 48-year-old Whig and supporter of Henry Clay, wondered, quote, if perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Polk together will make a very good president. Now, when Sarah and James went to the White House, they set up a shared office in the domestic quarters. Sarah left her piles of newspapers each morning to digest. Sarah worked through them all and then carefully folded the papers with marked pieces outside where a glance might detect them. She would place the pile beside his chair so whenever a few moments of leisure came, he could read, find and read without loss of time. 
the two of them regularly put in 12 to 14 hours of work a day. Polk admitted near the end of his life, none but Sarah knew so intimately my affairs. But even at the height of his powers, Polk was open about the degree to which he and his wife worked as a team. Typical was his comment when Sarah broke up an impromptu concert given by Democrats in his honor on the Sabbath. He said, Sarah directs all domestic affairs and she thinks this is domestic. Now, um, Sarah was a remarkably popular first lady, but she was not popular necessarily because she was Polk's political partner. The main reason that she was so popular was because she was very, very religious. Um, she was pious. Uh, she didn't drink. She stopped gambling in the White House. So um, she sort of uh, in personified a model of religious uprightness that um, ordinary people admired. Um, but they also extrapolated from that that um, her main influence would be to guide her husband's behavior by setting a moral example. And this is very much in keeping with that idea of domesticity in the women's sphere that women would lead through moral suasion. But James and Sarah's relationship bore very little resemblance to what the public imagined. Uh, not only were they political partners, but James generally set the moral example for Sarah, who, while um, very beneficent in public, was, was pretty judgmental in private and not above saying hurtful things about people, which James was not in support of. Now, Sarah was 42 when her husband was elected president of the United States, um, and she impressed everyone. Uh, her power and influence grew as first lady with the guidance of her mentor, Dolly Madison, who pioneered the art of politics in drawing rooms. Sarah learned how to deploy, employ domestic skills, which were never her strong suit, in the service of the political. Um, although her religious piety required that she ban hard liquor, dancing, and card playing from the White House, she pulled off entertaining executive dinners and balls in which gracious hospitality combined with lobbying. Uh, dressed in simple but meticulously tailored gowns, she cultivated a restrained elegance in keeping with her democratic ethos. She held two regular evening receptions every week and added a third each Saturday morning when Congress was in session. When James was unable to attend, she hosted these events alone. Powerful men cultivated her goodwill. More than one leading politician openly declared he would rather discuss the issues of the day with her than with her dour husband. Records from the period suggest that she met with politicians in the White House privately in the daytime as well, and that they have searched her out. And one really excellent example of Sarah's political influence was um, the changing way in which Vice President Dallas um, viewed her. When James was first elected, um, Dallas, who had a very conventional marriage to a wife that he left home in Pennsylvania, thought that Sarah was too bossy. And then in fact, she um, sort of ordered James around. But by the end of James's term in the White House, Dallas was bringing young politicians to meet with Sarah uh, because he had recognized her value um, politically. And one of my favorite details about Sarah Polk is that she was able to act as James private secretary and communication manager by making his niece, her nieces um, return all of the calls that were paid to her. Um, so basically she took the main labor that political wives, um, the main time consuming effort of political wives, which was returning calls uh, that other Washington ladies made on them um, she passed that off to her nieces so that she could instead stay and discuss legislation with James. Um, she was the first to establish a separate space in the White House for women to gather, um, but she almost never went there. She preferred to converse with men. By the time the two embarked on the U.S.-Mexico War, in May of 1846, uh, Sarah was the president's closest advisor and working as his private secretary. Here's a picture of Sarah. You can see one of her nieces directly next to her. Um, and this niece, Johanna, wrote um, wonderful letters about how Sarah would send her off in the morning with a whole list of people to visit. And that was basically what she had to do all day. Dolly Madison's over here on the side of the, the image. Um, this is what the United States looked like when the Polks first entered office. 
And this is what it looked like more or less um, when they left. Sarah's role in um, facilitating the US-Mexico war was pretty important. Um, I talk about it in great detail in the book. Among the things that she did to facilitate this war was um, holding frequent um, dinner parties in which she invited uh, veterans um, and made statements such as, Whatever sustains the honor and advances the interests of this country, whether regarded as democratic or not, she admired and applauded. Um, she spent a great amount of time controlling access to her husband, editing his news intake, and was able in that way to limit his exposure to increasingly vindictive partisan attacks on his presidency. Um, probably the most important thing she did was assuage um, people who would I don't want to call them him them his enemies, but members of the party who maybe weren't happy with what he was doing, she would speak to them privately um, and they would change their views. Now, I guess I want to end today by suggesting that, suggesting the reason why Sarah's political power isn't as well known as it might be. And that is because Sarah embraced a facade of deference. So like I told you, she opposed women's rights, mainly because she already had as many rights as she needed. Um, and she was always careful to present her own views as her husband. So she would always say, um, Mr. Polk thinks this or Mr. Polk wants that. Um, she acted as though she didn't have political power and that enabled her to actually um, practice political power. So by not putting herself forward as a political woman, she was actually able to become um, in incredibly politically powerful. On the other side, though, of that equation is that the fact that she never put herself forward as political enabled people to um, retrospectively erase her contribution um, to politics of the time period. Uh, so there's a lot more to say to Sarah about Sarah Polk. Um, I would love to have time to tell you guys about um, her actions during the Civil War um, in the later portion of her life. But let me just close by saying that Sarah Polk managed the trick of excelling in the male sphere of politics without seeming to threaten anyone. This was because as one approving commentator put it, she lived behind her husband as a politician. And in a period of increasing agitation for women's rights, Mrs. Polk cultivated a deferential persona that powerful men liked, they found intoxicating. She was a woman who openly venerated the political work of men and excelled at it in large part because she embraced a standard of female deference. And by, so by brilliantly manipulating the gender codes of the day, Sarah became one of the most powerful first ladies in history. And, and I would also like to point out, there were many other women, particularly in Washington, D.C., who were also politically powerful um, and whose actions have somewhat been obscured by the fight for voting rights. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Professor Greenberg. Let me get everything straight here. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, so folks, I've got uh, a few questions here in the Q&A. We're gonna start working through those uh, and we'll, we're, we have uh, some time to work through those. If you do have other questions, uh, please just put them there in the Q&A and we'll get to what we can uh, get to. Uh, so Professor Greenberg, we have a, a question from um, Amy Achenbach, who is a, a graduate student here at Baylor. Uh, she says, thank you for sharing about your book. Uh, I'm curious in what ways you see Sarah Polk diverging from first lady predecessors, especially others or others who used parlor politics to support their, their husband's careers. Um, in essence, what makes her such an influential practitioner of this, this form uh, of politics? What a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, I didn't have time to really go into. Dolly Madison was really her mentor and was, was her closest friend, closest female friend when she was in the White House. Uh, 
But Sarah did stuff that Dolly Madison never would have dreamed of. For instance, um, James writes in his diary that he came downstairs one day um, and found Sarah meeting with two politicians um, on her own to discuss things. Um, and he doesn't bat an eye at that. He just moves on. <laughs> um, I think a very, a big difference between um, Sarah and what she's able to do compared to other leading women, um, other, well, Dolly, and I guess you could say uh, Louisa Adams could have been very powerful. Um, a big difference is that James really embraces her political power. So he, he pulls her into it. Like he is putting her front and center in things. Um, at one point when he's running for governor and this, this one totally blew me away, he's off on the campaign trail and he writes to her and he says he's worried about a political editor of a newspaper and he asked her to go visit the editor and talk to the editor. Um, so basically he's telling his wife that she needs to go talk to an editor who he believes is hostile to him, uh, presumably to convince him to change his views. Um, and you know, it's just like really a lot to ask, but he was, he was always asking a lot of her. Um, he was always putting her on the spot and always expecting her to um, do the things that were necessary to advance his position. Um, there's a wonderful biography of Louisa Adams that suggests that um, John Quincy Adams just didn't take her seriously. And the fact that he didn't take her seriously meant that he lost um, the value that she might have held as a political spouse. So Sarah, she had a very fortuitous marriage. I do think education was important in this equation. Um, one thing about the education that she received at the Salem Women's Academy is that um, she was reading a, books that were very similar to books that men were reading um, over at what would become UNC. And she was reading political philosophy. Uh, she was reading a lot of history. Uh, and the women who came out of that program um, believed that they were the equivalent intellectually to men. And this is part of the appeal of this education is that you're really, you're educating women up to the same standard as men. I think she carried that with her. Um, I definitely think that it gave her the confidence um, in Washington, DC to stand up to anybody. Um, you know, when, when Sarah first showed up in Washington, DC, a lot of people said, oh, you know, we have, this is like this young girl, not girl, she's 23. Got this 23 year old from the middle of Tennessee, middle Tennessee, who is this? She's not famous. She's not from an incredibly important political family. Uh, and you know, nobody said that a second time. So she was just very, very confident. Um, she was just very powerful and sure of herself. And I think she got that from her education. Uh, the last thing I'll say about this, what set Sarah apart from um, other previous political wives, Sarah is the first political wife um, that I've seen who is independently writing to men who she's not related to about politics. And in some of those letters, the men are telling her things that they tell her not to tell her husband. So they are using her um, as a sounding board themselves. So she's at once a way to get information to her husband, but also a way to get information to her husband without him knowing that the information came from them necessarily. So um, I, you know, I found that correspondence really remarkable. And like I said, um, nobody's writing down to her. Like nobody's saying, nobody's suggesting she doesn't understand what they're talking about. Nobody's suggesting that she doesn't understand the minutia of banking bills. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple questions that I'll combine uh, from folks who want to know, and uh, they're, uh, I, I would say names, but there some people can, are submitting anonymously and other people are, have names. A couple of you wanna know a little bit more about her views about slavery and, and how much, and I know you talk about this in the book, so I know you can talk more about this. Um, obviously this is one of the central issues of her day. How much does she engage that and, or the people who are involved in that debate? And, and what do we know about her uh, in terms of her personal connections with and practice of slavery? 
Okay, this, so this is a huge question, right? Um, it was hard to write this biography because um, Sarah believed, and as far as I can tell her views on this never wavered, that white people were not only better than black people, but that they were meant to have power over black people. There um, is a, apparently, or reportedly, James and Sarah were in the White House and Sarah was looking out at some enslaved laborers working the grounds. And she said to James, um, you know, God meant for those people to be where they are and where we are. This is just how it was meant to be. And, and he thought that that was pretty far out, but he would frequently quote her um, to say like, this is, Sarah's, uh, this is Sarah's idea of how things are. Um, and again, I wanna point out, I, I think that part of this is drawn from her religious viewpoint. And I, and I really think it's important to point out, not everyone thought this, right? So not everyone who grew up in Tennessee necessarily believed that it was God's will that black people be enslaved. Um, and, but this, this was her view and she never really deviated from it. She was very invested in the view of herself as um, a kind slave mistress. Um, and if any of you have read Stephanie Jones Rogers' uh, marvelous book about women slave owners, you'll see the extent to which um, women were as invested and as involved in the worst parts of slavery as men were. Um, but Sarah thought that she was a kind mistress. Um, she made sure that the slaves that she inherited from her father, oh, I didn't point this out. Like one reason why she was such a great marriage catch is she inherited 10 enslaved people from her father. So she was really rich and her wealth was in human bodies. So this is one reason why people wanted to marry her. Um, she was very solicitous to the extent that nothing that she did ever inconvenienced her um, of the health of um, these people that she inherited. Uh, but ultimately she ends up um, owning a plantation in Mississippi. Well, first when James is president, she facilitates the sale of slave, the purchase and sale of slave children, um, which he can't do because he's president and presidents needed to at least pretend, they needed to maintain the facade of if they own slaves, that they only own slaves in order to keep families together. Um, but James was wanted to get labor for this cotton plantation in Mississippi. He wanted to get rich, so he was buying kids. He was buying children. Um, in Virginia and North Carolina and shipping them to Mississippi. And Sarah was facilitating all those sales uh, so that he wasn't, so he had plausible deniability. But James died um, just a few months after he left office in 1849. And Sarah inherited this Mississippi plantation with 55 people on it. So I devote a whole chapter of the book to looking at Sarah as a plantation um, owner and a plantation manager. Uh, and, and she ends up being just as um, harsh as any man would be. And she ultimately makes a lot of money off of um, slavery. So she's intimately involved in slavery. And you would have to say that she played a large role in um, the spread of slavery. So she's, you know, she's not a bystander. She's right there. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, also anonymous. Um, did you come across any rumors or scandals about Sarah during your research? Rumors or scandals? Uh, okay, so this one's hilarious. Um, so when after James died, there were rumors in the newspaper that she was gonna marry James Buchanan. Um, and the reason that this is hilarious, of course, is that James Buchanan was almost certainly gay. Uh, and it's 
so, but Sarah and James were good friends uh, when um, she was first lady. Uh, they they hung out a lot. Uh, they did stuff together. Um, they were just they were just good friends. Like they would he would accompany her on things when James wasn't there, and she would go with him on stuff. And um, so they they were friends. So after James died, there were these rumors that they were going to get married, um, which were ridiculous. Uh, and, but they remained friends um, when. Buchanan was president. He wrote Sarah um, asking if she could provide information about um, some negotiations between England and the United States uh, over the fate of like one of the San Juan Islands off of Washington coast. And she was able to do that. Like he knew that she could because he knew that she had political knowledge. Um, but, and, and in one of the letters he said, um, you know, we really wish we miss you. You should come back to Washington DC come stay in the White House with me and with my niece, Harriet Lane, and everybody wants to see you, but she, she didn't go. So what does it say about Sarah Polk? That's the best scandal that I can come up with. Um, both she and James were remarkably um, kind of straight arrow people. I don't know how else to put it. Like um, James for all his faults, and there were many, um, he had a kind of moral exactness about him that did not lend itself to scandal. He was like that even in college. Um, you know, he, he didn't drink. Um, he didn't gamble. Uh, he worked all the time. Um, he didn't visit prostitutes. He didn't have affairs. And she was just kind of like him. But, but more, more fun to hang around with. But, you know, they, neither of them drank. No scandals. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, another great question from uh, Carissa Bouvet. Uh, Carissa asks, uh, how did Sarah's intelligence, leadership, and confident behavior influence perception of women in the US as possible social or political equals? In other words, did she, did she have like a backhanded influence on women's equality despite not believing in it? That is such a great question. Thank you for asking that. Okay, so, you know, one of the weird puzzles about all this is that Sarah's one way. And the way that she is, is she's just um, negotiating with men all the time. She's meeting with men without James. She's such a political insider that people don't even question it. But the public image of her is very different. The public image of her is one of a dutiful wife of um, the perfect partner to James, but above all as a Christian. So she is understood as this model of Christian propriety in a period of time when religion means a ton to people. And when Washington DC was seen as a kind of moral backwater. So the fact that um, previous administrations um, had big parties with lots of rum and whiskey punches and that there was gambling going on in the White House and that there were balls, all these things. Washington DC had a freer um, social code than most of America did. And Sarah seemed to be bringing moral rectitude to the White House. So that was mainly the way that she was understood. So she wasn't, people didn't really see her the way that she was. And I think part of that was on purpose because she was very good at, um, manipulating or not manipulating, but, but handling the press. But, but what is great about this question is Sarah lives a really long time. So she lives to be 86 years old. She lives 50 years after her husband dies. And in the later part of her life, she gets involved with the women's um, Christian temperance union and um, they love her. So they see the fact that she didn't drink um, and that she cared about morals. Um, so they really embrace her as this kind of model of a woman. And she gets very involved with them and she gets a kind of like political stature from that. And at the same time, um, newspaper reporters turn to her, especially around the elections in the 1880s to get her opinion on things like politically. So she comes to her own as a political figure but not until very, very late in her life. So not until um, well after the period that we're talking about 
um, when she begins to mean a lot to a lot of different people um, as a political figure. Great. Um, uh, another question is, um, are there any uh, contemporary women who you would say take a similar approach to politics as Sarah Polk did um, uh, or have gender and politics changed so much that it's hard to make these comparisons? Are there, are there people on the national stage today that you would compare her to? That is a great question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think any time that you see um, conservative female politicians talk about family values, that seems straight out of Sarah Polk's playbook to me. Um, Phyllis Shafley, if you guys remember her, or know about her, um, you know, incredibly powerful political woman who talked about how women needed to respect men's authority and was opposed to the Equal Rights Amendment um, and, and said a lot of things that did not correspond to their own personal experience. Um, I, you know, when, um, uh, Ivanka Trump was around and in the White House, I definitely got a Sarah Polk vibe off of her, right? I mean, she is presenting herself as this mother and this, um, you know, perfect daughter. Uh, and yet she is exercising political power on her own. Um, so yeah, I think, I think anytime you see a woman who publicly is trying to tell other women that um, it's really important that their husbands um, be in charge. That's Sarah Polk. Great, thank you. And uh, let's see, we have time for at least one more question. Uh, Veronica Pinales asks, uh, do you think Sarah Polk married James Polk for personal gain within the realm of politics or did she actually love him? Oh my golly. Um, okay. Two things. So yes and yes. So I would say yes to both of those things. So it's not, it's not either or. There's no question in my mind that they recognized in each other a compatibility um, not only in terms of their personalities, they, they have opposite personalities, They're coming from the same backgrounds and opposite personalities. She's very outgoing. He's extremely reserved. Um, she's joking all the time. Um, the editor of the James K. Polk papers said he only found one example of James laughing in all of his correspondence. So um, they're, they're compatible. Um, what I would really like to know, and nobody knows, is whether James was aware he couldn't have children before he got married. Um, and if he did, then that just proves to me that they wanted a political partnership. I didn't mention this in the talk, but um, they were really proud to not have children. I mean, proud isn't the right way to put it. They had so many opportunities to adopt children and they never adopted children. And you know, Sarah and James Polk were the only presidential couple who never had children, like never had children either that they adopted or that they gave birth to themselves. They're the only couple, the only couple. So, um, and they could have had kids anytime they wanted, but they enjoyed, I think they enjoyed just being a, a partnership. They were deeply in love. There is no question. They were incredibly dependent on each other and um, really, really, really tight. Uh, but yeah, I think she married him because he was going to be a politician and he was going to be a democratic politician and she was already a democratic partisan. So it was perfect. She, and she loved her father. He had recently died. Um, he was a democratic politician. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, there are other questions, but we're going to try to end on time here. So I want to thank Professor Greenberg for uh, a wonderful talk. Thank everybody for coming. And I'm sure uh, that everybody is clapping in front of their screens, even though we can't hear you. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good evening. And uh, thanks again. Thank you.